I'm really excited to talk to you today about Hack Weeks, but I know we've all been sitting for a while, so if you feel like standing for a moment, I'm going to take a page out of Alex's playbook and say we're... <laughs> We've been sitting on those hard chairs for a couple hours now, so I also have this photo up here to kind of mentally cool you, given the heat of the day. Okay, and you can stay standing while I do my little intro here. I'm Michaela Parker. I'm the program coordinator for the MSDSEs, that's the Moore Sloan Data Science Environments, but I'm also first timer to CSV Conf, so I want to say thank you to Danielle and the other organizers. This is a really fun meeting, and I have learned a ton. I've met some amazing people, and I'm just really grateful for being part of this group. Um, so, if you are not familiar with the Morrison Data Science Environments, we are a partnership that started in 2013 between two funding agencies, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, represented by Chris Menzel, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, represented by Josh Greenberg. And those two foundations funded data science initiatives on three campuses at UC Berkeley, the Institute for Data Science, commonly known as BIDS, at the University of Washington, the eScience Institute, and at NYU, the Center for Data Science. And this partnership, um, the motivation was really in recognition that as data is increasing in all fields and in all forms, that even some of the very best researchers, especially on university campuses, were really struggling to generate knowledge and insight from these data. So there's essentially this gap between university domain research and data science best practice. And it was this gap that the partnership sought to address. So the mission was really to build bridges that would enable researchers to learn, use, and teach data-intensive research practices. And the idea was really to create a feedback loop. So as we bring these data science practices to the university researchers, this would enable them to make new discoveries, but that would also spur new questions and really push for new methods developments to occur. And these would feedback and then en enable even greater discovery. So the goal here was kind of this feedback loop. Those of you that are familiar with the MSDSEs are also very familiar with this figure, and some of you may be sick of it by now, but I think it still illustrates really nicely the, the bridges that this initiative was trying to push through. And they were loosely grouped into six themes, career paths and alternative metrics, education and training, software tools and environments, reproducibility and open science, which is something I know is important to many of you here, Working Spaces and Culture, and Ethnography and Evaluation. And this last one was renamed Data Science Studies. And today I'm going to talk about a program that really is at the heart of these three. So education and training, software tools, and reproducibility and open science. But the real authors and the real workhorses behind Hack Weeks are in this slide. I'm just kind of presenting their work today. And a lot of the take-home messages can be found in the paper that I've cited at the bottom here. That's Hoop and Quoten et al. 2018 in PNAS. The authors are, their photos are up here. Daniela was the lead author. And there were representatives on this paper from all three of the MSD institutions. And Daniela herself is actually a cross-pollinator. She started as a postdoc at NYU and then is now at the University of Washington with an affiliate position at the Science Institute. I'm also highlighting on the right-hand side, Christina and Nicoletta. These are the leads of the latest Hack Week to join the group, the Water Hack Week, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about how they've kind of evolved and taken some interesting approaches to change the Hack Week structure. So, Hack Weeks. This is essentially community building within domains. So many of you are familiar with hackathons or hackathon style events. Hack Weeks borrow from this concept, but they add a really strong component about around learning and um, peer teaching and learning. So, and pedagogy, sorry, around learning and pedagogy. So in this respect, they lie somewhere between a summer school and a traditional hackathon. The components of Hack Weeks include, as I said, because of the learning, lots of tutorials, both on introductory and state-of-the-art methodologies. But also, like more traditional hackathons, there is a component on participant-driven project work in a collaborative environment. And finally, as I alluded to, this emphasis on peer teaching and peer learning, and I think this is really what fosters the community in Hack Weeks, because it enables conversations across technical abilities, across career stages, and it really catalyzes the group in this learning environment. 
And also similarly with hackathons, Hack Weeks take advantage of shared language and shared scientific objectives. Some of the goals of Hack Weeks are to foster data analysis literacy within research domains, cultivate best practices, for example, around reproducibility in open science, and of course, develop resources for an existing domain-specific community. And the end result is that these folks that go through these Hack Weeks end up building a network that lasts far beyond that week, and it very often establish longer-term collaborations. So the Hack Week as a model for teaching and learning really came out of the astronomy field in 2014. It was then picked up a couple of years later by the neuroscience community in the form of Neuro Hack Week. And then the geospatial sciences also created a Hack Week and Geo Hack Week. But since then, these Hack Weeks have really grown and evolved. So Astro, Hack, Astro Data Hack Week, it used to be called, now Astro Hack Week, last year went international. They were hosted in the Netherlands. This year, they're gonna be at Cambridge University in the UK. Neuro Hack Week secured funding from NIH to become a two-week summer school called um, Neuro Hack Academy. And just last year, the oceanography community joined the fold with the first Ocean Hack Week. They're hosting another iteration this year. And this year, as I mentioned earlier, the latest uh, domain to join Hack Weeks is Water Hack Week. So they focus on freshwater resources globally. And the important thing here is that um, the Hack Week structure is really flexible and can be adapted to the needs of the different communities. So here I'm highlighting, I hope you can see this, the um, schedule for day one from Geo Hack Week. And in this particular domain, they were really interested in getting right into the project work. So the very first day, they spend some time on tutorials in GitHub, Jupyter Notebooks, working in the cloud environment, but they're already pitching projects and doing project work that afternoon. In contrast, Neuro Hack Academy, which admittedly is two weeks long, but for the entire first week, it is nothing but tutorials. They don't even start project work until the middle of the second week. And unfortunately for the, <laughs> the format here, they listed vertically instead of horizontally. So I hope you can read some of those. Um, but you can see that there's definitely introductory material on the first day. Again, GitHub, but also introduction to Python and R. A lot of these are borrowed from the carpentries. But then they quickly jump into more advanced um, topics. And as I mentioned, Water Hack Week started taking a slightly different approach. approach. They recognized that their community had really diverse and also very um, specific and technical types of tools that they wanted their participants to have a grounding in before they began. So what they offered were a series of training seminars as pre-work. And you can see kind of the dates at the end of those lines. The Water Hack Week was held at the end of March. So this is almost two months of opportunities to kind of learn and get a grounding in some basic tools before the community met and worked through the projects during the Hack Week. So now I wanna spend just a moment on participant diversity because this is something that's come up a lot in this conference and I think it's something that we all are share a really passion for. Um, as these Hack Weeks grow, there are often more applicants to the Hack Week than there are spots. It's really important for Hack Weeks to kind of maintain a small community, 40 to 60 is about the, the ideal size. But some of these um, Hack Week organizers are receiving applications on the order of 100 to 200. And so to start thinking about how do you choose um, participants when you wanna maximize diversity in a Hack Week becomes kind of a hard cognitive load. So Daniela Hubenkoden, the one who's also the first author on the PNS paper, wrote this tool, and it's available on GitHub, really well documented, called Entrofy. And unfortunately, when I told her I was gonna talk about this today, she said, oh, I gotta get the paper written. This is great, this is great incentive. And I felt terrible because I was pushing her now to like throw a paper out as fast as possible. She even asked me what time my talk was today. And I checked, I don't have the archive link yet, but she did submit it and it should be under computers and society section. So the idea with Entrify is to take participant selection and treat it as a discrete optimization problem. Again, really re relieving the organizers of that cognitive load of trying to juggle all the different attributes and factors of the people you might want to invite to your Hack Week. Um, Daniela also wanted me to make sure to say that Entrify doesn't make participant selection fair. 
It just lowers the cognitive load. It's still on the user to define the attributes of the community that you want to include. For example, junior versus senior researchers, experts from various disciplines, race, ethnicity, gender, and then also set the proportion of the targets that you want to include. So I'm going to give you just a real quick example, and I don't, I don't know how well you can see that. This is um, a plot showing the output from Entrify when it was used in a conference called Python and Astronomy. And again, there's a GitHub link there, and it's all very well documented, including all of the, I mean, it's completely transparent, all of the participant selection. In this case, the plot is just showing geography. So where did the applicants apply from? And they, the organizers decided to group geography into three loose bins, North America, Western Europe, and all others. And the blue bars are the proportions. I realize you can't see the y-axis, but it's fraction. Uh, the, blue, the blue bars are all of the um, applications they received, and the green bars are the recommended population that Entrify um, returned. The black line is what the, um, along the top there, is what the uh, organizers set as their target. And I know, again, I know you can't see that, but they arbitrarily set it at 33%. So they wanted a third from North America, a third from Western Europe, and a third from all other countries. And you can see Entrify does a pretty decent job. Um, very often, though, it won't be, it won't hit those targets exactly because, of course, it's also trying to optimize on a lot of other attributes. And so the user can also say, to me, it is more important that we have equal gender diversity versus some other attribute. So the user not only selects the proportions they want in the final population, but also the weight of importance of those attributes. So that brings me to choosing the right targets. Um, third, third, third from North America, Western Europe, and others may seem kind of arbitrary, which is why I really like what Water Hack Week has chosen to do. And they say here that accelerating scientific research and innovation on complex global water challenges requires a workforce with the diversity of the global population. I thought that was really cool. So they essentially set all of their attribute fractions, proportions, based on the global population. So I encourage you to check out um, Daniela's GitHub repo and um, try that tool yourself. Okay, so now I want to move on to how uh, successful are these hack weeks at their goals. And so um, those original three hack weeks, Astro Hack Week, Neuro Hack Week, and Geo Hack Week, ran a series of identical exit surveys. I'm going to show you some of the results. This first set of results focuses on how, how much do these hack weeks, in the participants' viewpoint, how much did the hack weeks help them in their science? So um, here are, are going to, I'm going to ground you to these plots first. So the questions were phrased as, I'm going to, there's a statement along the top, and then the participant would either agree or disagree. And I, I can see you squinting, so I'm going to explain. On the far left are folks that, can, that strongly agree with the statement, far right is strongly disagree, and then there's one box at the very far right that's I don't know. Um, the y-axis is the fraction of responses. And I'll go ahead and read them across, but I wanted to ground you in these plots first, because I'm actually going to show you the data as each separate hack week, but I think what I'd rather for this talk is that you just kind of get a, a sense of the general trend. So for example, in the first box, I hacked on topics, tools, or methods that were very new to me. In general, most of the participants kind of agreed with this. There were a few that disagreed. In the center plot, I believe the hack week helped me be a better scientist. There's a strong positive signal there. And then I feel like I learn things which improve my day-to-day -day research. So again, strong positive signal there, suggesting these hack weeks are helping the researchers in their actual science, doing their work. But in addition, one of the goals of the hack weeks was best practices. And in particular, we're curious about working open. So in this case, the plot on the left says, I'm embarrassed to put my code and data in online. And there's a fairly even distribution here. So as you can see, there's still a sentiment that people are genuinely embarrassed to, as many of us may be, to put our code and data online. Similarly, in the middle plot, I am afraid that if I put my code and data public, I will be scooped. Again, there's some, a lot of the responses disagreed with this statement, but there are still some that agreed with it. But now what's interesting is if you contrast that to this question, 
I feel scientists have an obligation to make their code and data public. There's strong agreement with this sentiment. So the researchers in these hack weeks genuinely feel like it is their obligation to make their code and data public, but they're still hesitant about perhaps how to do it or they're embarrassed. And so I think there's an opportunity here to kind of help shepherd this community into those reproducible and open science tools. And during the hack week, they definitely got some of that best practices and help. So in this far, in the left panel here, I put code and or data I created at hack week up on GitHub or another public repo. So definitely many of them did this. I feel like X hack week made me more comfortable with doing open source, open science. Strong agreement there too. So not only are hack weeks helping researchers with their actual research, doing better science, but we are also slowly incentivizing them and convincing them to work openly and to adopt some reproducible best practices. So as I mentioned earlier, all of these data and more are available on this paper from in PNAS. And I, before I wrap up, I want to also talk about an, a, a flip side to this, which is community learning across domains. So Hack Weeks, as, you, as I mentioned, is really about bringing community together and learning within a domain with shared language and shared scientific objectives. XD communities, XD for across domain, are opportunities for researchers from all different domains to come together and work on similar problems together identifying common principles, algorithms, and tools. So it's a much more methods-focused community building. XD communities largely exist at Berkeley, but they have been hosted elsewhere. XD communities and the groups host seminars, they write blogs, but importantly, they also run these workshops, and those are based heavily on the pedagogy from the Hack Weeks. They're shorter, two to three days, but they also include, just like Hack Weeks, tutorials, make sessions, and in this case, also talks by experts. So in the inaugural Hack Week, uh, uh, the, sorry, <laughs> I'm used to saying Hack Week, in the inaugural Image XD, this is the image processing across domains, which was in 2016, 50 researchers from 11 different, different institutions came together to work specifically on image processing problems. And I just listed a number of the different fields that they came from, and you can see there's everything from computer vision to earth science, neuroscience, astronomy. So they're coming together around the tool rather than around the domain. And this concept is also expanding. So there's now text XD for text analysis and graph XD. Um, both of these were held more recently. Some of the example outcomes from these workshops include blueprints for open source image processing, in the case of the image XD, training sets for ML applications, and of course analysis projects. So the takeaway here is that informal, intensive, community-driven learning, it's a lot of words, informal, intensive, community-driven learning, like Hack Weeks and XD workshops, quickly and effectively bring data science to campus researchers. And importantly, emphasize that data science is for and by everyone. It is not owned by computer science or computer science plus statistics. Anyone from any field can contribute to the advancement of data science. So my last slide is a plug. <laughs> As the coordinator for the Morse on Data Science Environments, that partnership is starting to wind down, and so I'm starting to think, what is the next thing? And I'm really focused and continue to be heavily invested in academic data science. And I think community building for academic data science still is, serves a great need. Um, and shamelessly, I actually just want an excuse to continue seeing all these wonderful smiling faces behind me, which are the folks who attended the last MSDSE annual summit. So, woo! <laughs> so my next initiative, which is currently tentatively called the Academic Data Science Alliance, or ADSA, um, I'm hiring a community coordinator and a program assistant. You can um, ask me about that by going to adsupply at msdse.org. I also left um, job descriptions on the table outside. It's not posted online yet, but it will be soon. Um, so shameless plug, I am hiring. Come talk to me if you want to work in the space. And uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you.